good afternoon once again to all our listeners and thank you for joining us for another Al Alatia Foundation interview and to our special guest today, uh, Ms. Mechthild Vorstorfer. Welcome and thank you for taking the time to join us from what I'm sure will be an excellent interview. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Stephen. Looking forward to it here from Paris. Well, you joined the International Energy Agency in October 2018 as Director of Sustainability, Technology and Outlooks. Before that, you were a Director for Energy Policy and I think notably managed the development of the Energy Union Framework Strategy, Governance and External Aspects. Academically, you are an economist, but have you always been interested in energy, economics and climate change? I've always been interested, but more on a personal basis. But it's now since 12 years I'm working on energy and climate policy issues. As you mentioned, I joined the International Energy Agency three years ago in summer here in Paris. And before that, I worked roughly 10 years uh, at the European Commission on different energy policy files, uh, Energy Union 2050, uh, renewables, energy efficiency. So. Yes, since 12 years, I would say uh, I've been professionally working on energy and climate policy, now internationally. And before that, it was more uh, on a private interest basis, all linked to questions I was dealing with on competitiveness, international trade and others. Uh, the, the, the stance of the IEA seems to have changed over the years, uh, changed perhaps from um, a, a champion of consumers uh, through to the role of an advocate for a dialogue with the energy producers. Now, uh, a strong advocate for positive action for climate change. Is, is that a fair summary uh, of the changing role of the IEA? I think climate change has always been important and part of the IEA's work. But to give you the background, the IEA was founded in 74 out of the oil crisis. So the founding members were those who were consumers and the main task was to ensure oil security. But over the years, the concept of security has much, much more broadened. We now work on oil, gas, coal, and more and more on electricity security. And to your question, climate change, the first scenarios related to climate change work we did in 2008. But I would say since 2015, with the new executive director at the head of the IEA, Dr. Fatih Birol, and the mandate we got from our members, the pathway to clean energy transition had been strengthened. And over the last year, a difficult COVID year, we have really put climate change at the heart of all our work. And I can tell you a little bit more about it in a minute. Yes, indeed, because obviously a, a huge year for climate change, two very big conferences, but with regards uh, to your recent writings with Tom Howes on the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement, it seemed to be a recap of what was achieved. Are you disappointed or pleased, perhaps even elated with the progress to date? I mean, tackling climate change requires very fundamental changes on how we produce and consume energy. And that has really fundamental impact implications for the structure for our economies. So we know it's not easy. But now the good news is most countries, I think 190 out of 197, have really signed up to the Paris Agreement, including the US as one of the first measures uh, the new president did to sign up again for Paris Agreement. So, and we know that a lot of the countries are working on their national determined contributions and an update. So a lot is happening right now on improving the climate change and looking forward to COP26 in Glasgow. But I think we should all be aware that we need, uh, we are currently not on track and we need obviously much more to come. And we see good signals, which makes me optimistic, like the reduction of technology costs giving the example of solar, which is now the new king of electricity. Well, various 
positive opinions have been uh, uh, given out about reaching the emissions levels needed to limit the temperature rise to two degrees centigrade, but they're not so positive about 1.5 degrees. What, what's your uh, view of that? What's your opinion? I mean, the 1.5 degree scenario, and we did that, what we called the net zero case in our world energy outlook in 2020. And I mean, it's very clear, it's extremely ambitious. And we need, we looked at the pathway needed from now to 2030, which should be in line to put the CO2 emission to net zero globally by 2050. We say it's possible, but extremely, extremely challenging. But it would make the necessary and significant difference in reducing the risk of damaging uh, climate change. So in, in order to get improved air quality, energy access, new industrial capacity, which we need to achieve at the same time, I think it's a huge challenge, but it's feasible. Well, that's good to hear, feasible at least. Uh, <laughs> one of the key topics dominating energy industry discussions at the moment is the uh, imperative task of, uh, quote, limiting emissions. Uh, are you of the opinion that for a transition to a non-fossil fuel energy state to take place, that many sources will be needed? Yes, I think we need all kind of sources and all kind of clean energy technologies. But let's look at last year. We all suffered from a health crisis, economic crisis, but the impact on the energy sector was huge. We have seen the biggest drop in energy demand since World War II, and we saw a drop of CO2 emissions of minus 7%, even more because uh, oil and gas and coal were most hit, because the transport and, and uh, aviation sector was most hit. So we, have, we need to work together to make that last year a peak in emission. It was a temporary, related to the crisis, reduction of CO2 emissions. But in order to avoid a rebound we need really all governments to put clean energy transition and climate change on the top of their agenda. And we saw in our latest report, which came out two weeks ago, that in some parts of the world, like in China, with the economy going up again, the increase in, uh, in emissions came out in December last year, 2020. So compared December 2019 to December 2020, there was in some of our regions already an increase in emissions. And that is a very worrying sign for me. And that means we really need to work on avoiding this rebound. I mean, having growth of the economy, but at the same time, keeping an eye on the reduction of emissions. What's your view then uh, with regards to the viability of measures such as CCS, energy efficiency and nuclear power? As I said before, we need all kinds of technologies. All kinds of clean technologies will play a, uh, an energy uh, a key role in energy transitions. We have done a technology perspective uh, with a faster innovation case, which means we can achieve a lot with energy efficiency and material e efficiency. It should be the first fuel, if I, I may say so. We should look at all possibilities to reduce and make our consumption of energy more efficient. But that's not enough. We still need to electrify. We still need more and more energy demand in our emerging countries that where it's growing. So we need to put an emphasis on renewables. Prices are going down for solar and wind. They are very good signals. But that also is not enough. That would cover mainly the power sector. But half of the emissions are coming from industry and buildings and there, or transport, and there we need to find other technologies. And you spoke about calm capture and storage. That might be the solution for what we call the hard to abate sectors, energy intensive industries like steel or chemicals. You also spoke about energy efficiency, which I already mentioned, and nuclear power. Nuclear power is a low carbon uh, technology, a low carbon energy resource. And for the countries who have chosen to go for nuclear power, this is the right way to be part of the clean energy transitions. So to cut it short, we need to be open for all technologies because there are 
not one fit all, uh, one size, one fit, size all <laughs> fit all <laughs> solutions for all regions in the world. What about then um, the hydrogen economy? Do you think hydrogen is a viable route for electricity generation? Uh, and what about for difficult industrial processes such as steel, aluminium, concrete? Will hydrogen from electrolysis uh, green ever be viable compared to hydrogen produced by methane reforming, followed by carbon capture or blue hydrogen? Yeah, there is a lot of talk about hydrogen nowadays, and I, I think rightly so. We came out uh, a year, a year and a half ago with a global hydrogen uh, report uh, underlining the momentum and the opportunities for hydrogen. But maybe we should be realistic right now. Hydrogen nowadays, today, is mostly used in oil refining and the production of fertilizers, and it's 99% based on fossil fuel, gas and coal. So in order to have a clean hydrogen, whatever the color is, blue or green, I think we need both, we need to tackle various, it can help to tackle various energy challenges. You spoke about the industrial processes, which we cannot electrify. We need a very high temperature to produce steel or aluminum or concrete, and there are process emissions. And the only way nowadays is to tackle it, for example, with hydrogen, either hydrogen produced by electrolyzers based on renewables or hydrogen based on gas combined with CCUS. For the time being, the cost issue is the main uh, challenge for the green hydrogen. So we need to look at how to bring down the cost for electrolyzers, which are 60% of the cost, and have an economy of scale. But we also need the demand to make it happen so that this economy right. of scale can happen. So if we have both and the right framework and the focus from the governments, and we see more and more hydrogen strategies, the EU, Germany, Chile, Canada, Japan, all over the world, which is good, but we need to be realistic that for the time being, and we see a, a, a good role for hydrogen as an energy carrier, but probably we need to be open to all kind of colors, but it needs to be low carbon. So we need to be open and push uh, for the green hydrogen, and there is a huge opportunity there. But for some regions and some sectors, we might also look at blue hydrogen combined uh, gas coal with CCS. I mean, you mentioned the EU there. The EU seems to be uh, the most proactive regional grouping in leading and perhaps setting the pace for climate change action. Is that right? And if so, why do you think that is? I mean, the EU has taken, and my past, uh, I've been spending 20 years in Brussels working with the European Commission. They had put climate change high on the agenda since many, many years. Energy Union, uh, and now with the new commission, big priority is European Green Deal and to make Europe the first continent to be carbon free or carbon neutral. And they have taken very concrete steps, a target for 2030 with minus 55% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and, and net zero by 2050. And they have a emission trading system established since more than 12 years which is working well. It's the biggest global carbon market or the regional carbon market uh, with a carbon price, which has gone up, which triggers the, um, the challenges, uh, the, the good opportunities with a higher carbon price. So EU has, has done, I think, a great job, but implementation and uh, transposition and all that is still a challenge. But others are following. I mean, we, the good sign is that more and more countries are putting net zero targets by 2050, uh, like Japan or South Korea rec relatively recently, and China by 2060. And the US will come up sooner or later with their own uh, carbon neutral target. So I think there's great momentum overall uh, to, to, to come up with a net zero uh, roadmap by 2050. And by the way, the IEA is working on such a roadmap to be published in May. Yeah, uh, next interesting. That, this that, year. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we'll look forward to uh, seeing that. Gas, 
uh, does seem to be gradually replacing coal as a primary source of energy for electricity um, or generation of electricity. Have we have we finally seen the end of coal in Europe, do you think? And is the lignite problem resolved for all of European countries? I think most European countries, 16 out of 27, have endorsed or they have begun the consideration of phase out, phase out plans of the, over the coming decades. So there is certainly in the EU and in the US, by the way, uh, a transformation and a phase out of coal over time, including the country uh, which I know best, Germany, who is the biggest, largest coal consumer in Europe. They have uh, done a, a compromise at, uh, to phase out coal by the latest, at the latest, by 2038. But others, I think, and it might come earlier with the ETS price, with the carbon price and all the measures. One aspect which is important here is also the social aspects. So in order to make that transition away from coal, and as I said, it's maybe easier in the EU and the US because most of the coal power plants are old, the UK as well, there is another picture in Asia where most of the coal power plants are relatively young and China and India are the biggest emitter. I mean, China yeah. is the biggest China, emitter. China is the biggest, yeah. Yeah, and India is at 8%, but per head very low, but it's the, the future growth uh, there, which is the potential. So I think the, the EU and the US have done well, but we should look at China and India. There is a potential to switch from coal to gas, which would halve the emission and then further go on for renewables, energy efficiency and other low carbon. So gas in my mind can be a transitional fuel, at least for Europe that is the case and becoming decarbonized over time. But for China, India, it might really replace coal uh, in the medium term, in the short term, and then in the longer term have other solutions in addition. As small wind and solar plants uh, appear to be um, popping up uh, worldwide, but changes to grids in countries that have them will be very expensive. So we go back to the cost equation again. Where will the money come from in the first instance for financing? And in the long term, is it inevitable the consumer will have to pay through, for example, carbon taxes? I think the consumer issue is a very important one in many ways. I mean, consumers shouldn't pay the cost of it, but they should be aware and become also more active, what we call prosumers. But coming back to your question on renewable and the need for grid expansion, which is, is, is a very valid question and a very important question, um, I think we need much more investment in electricity grids, not only because we have more and more renewable share. This is only part of the question. It's more complex. We also see that, for example, the existing grids in the US and other parts of the world, in, in Europe as well, they, they are old. And we need to invest in modernizing them, in linking cross-border and have more uh, international uh, possibilities for transmission of electricity, because we all know electricity and electrification is the future. So renewables are part of the need to have more transition, transmission line and also more distribution network, but there's also a broader need to have more modern grids, smart grids, digitalized grids to allow that flexibility we need between supply and demand. Okay, let's sort of moving towards the end of this podcast now. But uh, before we go, we need your opinions on the circular economy. It seems this is more a change of a mindset that is needed rather more than specific technology solutions. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes, uh, I fully agree. Indeed, the circular economy requires the engagement of different actors, which I tried to explain before, consumers, product developers, and governments. Overall, I think governments in that whole debate we had right now, are having right now, have a huge responsibility to uh, make the right framework for this climate change to happen and also the circular economy. And we see that the reuse and the recycling of materials is a priority for most of our governments. And that uh, is contributing uh, uh, 
to to the debate and and the need for more climate change and also in our scenario we knew, we use a rate of plastic waste collection which would triple up to 2070 so we see there is progress made and it's a very important element of the debate okay well you touched on this uh, earlier um cop 26 due to take place uh, in glasgow at the end of the year um now cop 26 means it's the 26th UN climate change conference and it's, the, the hope is it will accelerate action towards achieving the goals in the Paris Agreement. Um, I wonder what you think might be achieved this time round because it's on climate change is on a lot of agendas but how many of the goals have actually been achieved? Yeah I think it's it's a really pivotal year for climate change and energy. It's the COP26 which is I think from COP21 here in Paris, the most important one. There are a couple of questions on implementation, but the key factor will also be the national determined contribution. Basically, how governments will tackle climate change and reduce CO2 emission in the medium and long term. And as I said before, we see an excellent momentum that major economies are coming up with improvements with new net zero strategies with updated NDCs but I think the countries will really come together and make that clear commitments to the Paris Agreement and at COP26 but also followed by action and I think the UK we will organize IEA UK next week Wednesday a major summit on net zero together COP26 IEA virtually on Wednesday, 31st of March, we have the four biggest emitters um, present, the US, China, India, and the EU, and many other energy and climate players at ministerial level and social society. And there will be other events throughout the year. So I think with this determination in the year where also recovery and stimulus packages play a role, there's a good chance the UK and the COP26 presidency will be a success, but it needs all actors to be committed. Well, uh, Ms. Mechthild Vosdorfer, I believe that's all we have time for today. On behalf of the Alatia Foundation, I'd like to thank you for joining me for this interview and providing the Foundation with your excellent insights. And I look forward to hearing from you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, and thank you very much for giving me that possibility.